starting. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this webinar and podcast of the North American Regional Committee and Latin American Regional Committee from the International Insolvency Institute. Uh, I'm sorry, Eva. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. We do not uh, initiate the webinar yet. Okay. 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 Just, there's one minute. Out. Okay. You told me? Yes. Yes. Just a okay. second. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to this webinar and podcast of the North American Regional Committee and Latin America Regional Committee of the International Insolvency Institute. It's a pleasure to have with us uh, Lisa Donahue from Alex Partners, Elizabeth Pillon from Stigman Elliott, and Alejandro Sainz from Science Abogados. Um, we are going to talk about the bankruptcy asset sales in the NAFTA countries in the US, in Canada, and Mexico. So Lisa, can you tell us about the general overview of asset sales procedures in the US, please? Sure, thank you, Ivan, for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me to today's panel. I'll start by discussing a quick overview of how the asset sales generally occur um, within the US bankruptcy process. To start with, early in the restructuring and oftentimes before the bankruptcy filing actually occurs, the debtors, their advisors, and certain key stakeholders will map out an optimal path ideally how you're going to get out on the other side of a bankruptcy. And when considering how to best market and sell the valuable estate assets, many debtors rely on what's known as a 363 sale. Debtors often utilize this process to sell ass assets in a court supervised setting, receive the proceeds in an expedited time frame before going through the full confirmation process. And as most of you probably know, that can sometimes be cumbersome and a bit time consuming, the full process. The 363 process is pretty straightforward and well known amongst US bankruptcy professionals. First, ground rules are set, then an auction is held with the goal of getting the highest and best price for the specific assets. Often, substantial majority of operating assets are put through this process, whether in pieces or sometimes altogether as an enterprise sale. Buyers are generally able to purchase the assets that they want, leave behind non-core or non-valuable assets, and also define what operating liabilities they wish to assume. Although typically most buyers leave behind the majority of liabilities with the estate, that's one of the benefits of selling assets through a bankruptcy. The bankruptcy court, of course, has final approval of the sale, and the, will the winning bidders obtain the assets free and clear of the liabilities. Engaging with bankruptcy professionals who are experienced with this process is important for the parties involved. Bidders will be under an expedited due diligence timeframe, must be aware of the procedures outlined ahead of time in order to make sure that they comply with, with whatever procedures the court has entered into. Debtors are going to be challenged to prove the process they developed is obtaining the highest and best offer, is not rushed or favoring certain parties. Unsecured creditors part committees participate. Um, they'll challenge the timelines, they'll challenge the costs, they'll challenge the expense reimbursements, all 
in a quest as part of their job to make sure that getting highest and best use for their constituents. The use of the 363 asset sale can occur in a prearranged, it can be part of a prepact or even an unplanned bankruptcy. However, in each circumstance, the judge overseeing the bankruptcy will have the final say if the 363 sale is permissible. All stakeholders involved in the process have opportunities to object to the sale at various times throughout the proceeding. Courts are sometimes wary of allowing 363 sales when substantially all of the company is being sold as the intent of a 363 sale is not to undermine the actual confirmation process and other associated requirements. Effectively, many 363 sales are akin to a liquidation of the debtors, leaving behind minimal assets and liabilities with the remaining estate. One final point, many debtors now rely on a strategy referred to as a toggle plan. This type of plan allows for the debtor to first try to sell itself, often through a 363 process, for some sort of minimum price, testing the waters for what a sale price could be. If a minimum strike price is not achieved after marketing the assets, then the plan toggles to another restructuring plan, often a debt for equity stop um, with pre-petition lenders ended up taking the keys. Thank you. I want to remember to all the uh, participants that you can have access to a simultaneous translation to the Spanish, and you can ask for that in the below part of the of the screen. So Liz, what's going on in Canada with uh, asset sales? Great, thank you very much. So in Canada, that we have a, uh, a number of different proceedings that we can um, go under, but I'm gonna primarily focus on our Companies Creditors Arrangement Act, CCAA. That is where the debtor remains in possession, similar to the chapter 11 that Lisa was speaking about. Um, and that's the, the best way I want to describe the two options, the true two primary options in which we see the change of control or change of ass, sale of assets within a restructuring. It can happen one of two ways, historically, a plan of arrangement or a going concern asset sale. There's a third one called a reverse vesting order, which we're going to touch upon a little bit later in the presentation, but plan of arrangement versus a sale of assets vesting order. In both cases, so in the plan of arrangement, the debtor remains in possession. They have a, an ability to do operational restructuring, disclaim certain assets, disclaim certain liabilities, or trigger the disclaimers of them so that you can make, you can clean up the process or in the company and then and then implement a plan which will have a sponsor, someone coming in, uh, sometimes the existing debt holder. Uh, to affect a change of control above the company, but the company itself remains in place. So the debtor remains in place, the assets remain where they are, it's effectively a compromise or sometimes a change of control above it. It involves a plan, it involves classifying your various creditors, sometimes just secureds versus unsecureds, um, and any uh, operational restructuring that you've done to try to clean the company would then create or result in various buckets of creditors who would need to be a part of the process, be entitled to vote on the process, and then ultimately that plan goes to court to get approved. So there's a voting mechanism, there's a calling for claims. It can be a timely process to go through uh, that process. It's important though sometimes to keep the plan and to affect a change of control through the plan if you have tax losses, um, licenses that you wish to preserve, uh, certain assets that are difficult to move outside of the company and transfer. So people would look to the plan as a means of affecting a change or, or, or a compromise. The second way is the going concern sale. Sometimes we call it a liquidating CCAA, but it is not a liquidation in the sense of piecemeal, it is trying to sell and affect a sale of the company as a going concern, but you might hear it described as a liquidating CCAA, but that is an asset deal. And so the purchaser is able to cherry pick which assets it wishes to take and leave behind which liabilities it does not wish to take on and assume as part of that transaction. And the deal gets affected by way of an approval investing order. So a sales process is run, and we'll talk a little bit later about how a Canadian sales process is run, but it affects an asset deal 
to a new entity, a new purchaser who transfers those assets outside of the existing debtor to a new entity. That does not involve classification of creditors. It doesn't involve a vote of any kind. It does involve a court approval of the process and of the actual ultimate agreement. And then a vesting order that ensures that the purchaser acquires the assets free and clear. But in that sense, there's no, um, there's no voting. And oftentimes, there is no recovery to the unsecured creditors in those scenarios as opposed, to, excuse me, opposed to a plan of arrangement, which at least would have something that's available for each category of creditors, including unsecureds. So those are our two options generally in Canada, plan of arrangement and liquidating CCAA asset deal. Thank you. Alejandro, what's going on in Mexico? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Ivan, and, and thank you so much uh, for the triple I for the for the invitation. Yeah, let me let me provide a first a general overview on what's going on in Mexico, and then in a second stage, I'll go in more detail into the into the process uh, to obtain. No? In Mexico, uh, certainly we have uh, under our concursos law uh, and a specific uh, process in order to proceed with it sale of the assets. Uh, the sale of the assets uh, could occur in, in different situations. Uh, during our conciliation stage that is similar to, to a chapter 11 process in, in United States uh, that is basically aimed to, to keep the going concern of the company and emerge with our restructuring plan, uh, you can proceed with the sale of assets uh, either uh, through a specific sale outside of the plan uh, that basically you identified an asset and, and the company, of course, which is in an insolvency situation, uh, it's in the need uh, to get liquidity. So then you need to follow a specific uh, uh, process uh, in order to get the court approval on the specific uh, sale of certain non-key asset uh, uh, as part uh, uh, of, the, of the ordinary course uh, of the process. Uh, however, uh, also you can incorporate into the restructuring plan the sale of the assets. I mean, the sale of the assets could, could be also the solution in order uh, to obtain funds uh, to, to make the payment uh, under the plan to the recognized creditors. Uh, if this is part of the plan, of course, you need to respect uh, the waterfall and the, and the different type of creditors set for in the concursus law. Similar to US and, and Canada, we, we have different classes of creditors. So you, you need to observe uh, uh, that allocation according to the plan, okay? Uh, the third uh, uh, possibility it is in, in also similar to, to the chapter seven in US in the stage of liquidation of quiebra. And in that stage of liquidation of Kira, it's as we will see it in the next uh, uh, block of, of this webinar, uh, you need to follow uh, different procedures. Uh, uh, basically, if because in the stage of Kira liquidation, it's possible now to reach also a, a liquidation plan or uh, just for the receiver or the liquidator to follow up a very strict uh, process depending on the type of assets, whether this is a, a general bid of all of the assets as a unit, whether this is in a piecemeal fashion uh, or whether even the, the, the liquidator, it's, it's authorized the receiver to make an exceptions and even to, to skip uh, a, a public uh, bid if, it's, if there's the need uh, to proceed with the sale of any specific assets to preserve the, the value of that asset, no? And, and, and then otherwise you're running the risk on, on losing value of that asset if you just wait to a public uh, bid situation. No? So that is that is basically the situation. Uh, Pre-packs in, in Mexico uh, are uh, certainly allowed, uh, uh, but the, the, the pre-pack, it is, it is just the, the general draft or the general overview of a draft to be implemented that has been uh, pre-authorized by the majority uh, uh, required to pass the plan. No? But I'm, I'm going to make a stop there. Uh, to, to explain in more detail uh, the procedural steps uh, that you need to follow on each of the of the different scenarios. Thank you, Alejandro. A follow-up question. I heard uh, from the US and Canada that there are committees that have to approve the sales. So in Mexico, happens that? Uh, no. Uh, in Mexico, we don't have, uh, for example, like, a, like an... Uh, you know, on secure creditors committee, uh, uh, basically, you know, the, the authorization needs to be carried out uh, by, by the judge 
uh, with the prior authorization, depending on the stage of the conciliador, that it is in, in our reorganization phase or, or the receiver or liquidator, uh, but we, don't, we do not have those committees. Uh, of course, if the creditors, a certain majority of the creditors are appointed as a man of law and intervener, that that is possible, uh, some, someone that supervises the activities of the conciliador or the receiver, then in that specific case, uh, you need to get the opinion of that third party intervener but only the opinion is not a binding opinion with respect to that sale, no? And, and of course, uh, that could be objected. And in Canada, we don't have an unsecured creditors committee uh, in our statute. We do have a different um, court officer role that perhaps you don't have, but I know you don't have in Chapter 11s, um, is the monitor or the receiver. So in a CCAA process, we have a monitor, EY, FTI, a trustee, who comes in and is appointed right away at the beginning of the um, of the proceeding, and they are they're often referred to as the eyes and ears of the court. They're there to assist all stakeholders and the company, but they also help to give guidance and report to the court. So they will report. They're very important in the sales process. Right in the CCAA, their recommendations are necessary and are looked to by the court. And I know the courts both in Canada and I know the US courts have also gotten used to our monitors and, and see them as very helpful in the process. So although you don't need the, uh, you don't have a UCC or that type of committee um, that you need approval of, you do need the recommendation of your monitor or you should be going with the recommendation of the monitor. And so that it, that's another party um, that's involved in our process. That's an important part. Just, so I just want, get, can sorry, I just sorry. clarify really quickly? Um, you don't, Having um, you, it's not required to have the approval of the UCC for an asset sale. It's required to have the approval of the judge for an asset sale. Um, it makes things a lot easier if you're in agreement with the UCC and if they also see that it's value enhancing. Um, but depending on where they sit and depending on where the value, the fulcrum sits in, in an estate and how you're trying to drive your process, you may or may not, there, as you navigate through, there's going to be issues that the committee agrees to and that they don't agree to. But in order to sell an asset, you, it, committee approval is not required. Judge approval is required. That's quite interesting. And that's uh, my, my next question. The, the monitor that and I'm understanding also from Lisa and Alejandro's participation, it's a governmental uh, authority or it's a private person that will intervene in the process in Canada lease and for the general floor, uh, which is the participation of the courts within this pro sale process? It's not a government entity. The, the monitor is not a government entity. As, you know, it's an EY, it's an FTI. It's a, it's a, a it would be the financial advisor that you're used to in, in other proceedings. So um, it's not, they're not appointed by the government. They are court appointed as part of the initial order. Um, but so, so it's separate, it's different animal. Um, and then the court is obviously very important. The entire process is supervised by the court and they need to be approving the sales process and then the ultimate result. Or if it's the sale is affected as part of a plan, they are sanctioning. There's a requirement for them to sanction the plan at the end of the piece as well. So the court's obviously a very important um, part participant. Lisa, do you want to add something? Alejandro? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, very quickly on, on what uh, Liz was saying, uh, that, I, that I think it's, it's important uh, also to add with respect to what's going on in Mexico. Uh, you know, in, in Mexico, it is absolutely internally, of course, the company, the debtor, identifies the need for liquidity, okay? And, and certainly they run an internal process with the help of their... Uh, internal advisors, you know, the, the, the operating or, or the financial advisors to identify uh, those on encumbered assets, you know, as, as, a, as a main objective uh, that could be subject to a sale. Uh, the situation it is that you need uh, to have a support 
uh, and a price sell value in order to support that sale in order to prevent objections from third parties. At the end, uh, let's assume that there's a debtor. The debtor is in the need of a, of a liquidity with the support uh, of their advisor, restructuring advisors identify that asset and, and a potential buyer. But then uh, you need to get the approval of the conciliador. Again, that, that is a, a, an auxiliary of the judge appointed by, by the IFECOM. The, the IFECOM is the, the administrative a, a agency of the judicial power that supervises and interacts with the concurso courts. Uh, or the receiver if this is the, the stage of quiebra. And then uh, uh, in that situation, uh, uh, certainly the court uh, will need to approve it or at least not to object it. But again, uh, in order to avoid objections with respect to the price, always it's important to support uh, the value of, of that sale because this is not a full liquidation in a public bid. Uh, but just when you want, you need the liquidity to support it with a, with a price uh, value. Great. Lisa, I, I do believe that the U.S. has the most development in this area. Or the 363 uh, article is used all around the globe, just an example. Can you go into the process that is uh, have to be held for, for going into this, please? Sure. Um, so when you think about um, an asset sale in a U.S. Chapter 11, you think about who's controlling and who's driving the process. And as long as the company remains a debtor in possession, it's the debtor who's driving the process with support and advice, as Alejandro and Liz both said, from, from advisors as far as making sure that you're, you're trying to get highest and best, you're running a clean process, a robust process, and you get the valuation. So what typically ends up happening is you put together what's known as bidding procedures, and you file them with the court and you outline what your process um, is intended to be, including the time to submit a bid, the, the process. Um, typically, there'll be some sort of minimum bid or a stocking horse bidder. Um, and what happens is it lays out quite comprehensively step by step and what are the requirements for the sale. Timelines of events, deadlines, um, how you can be an eligible bidder, and basically describing how the auction works. And um, it's, it's tried and true. And again, it's designed to get highest and best value for the assets of this estate. If you don't um, go through a 363, another common way is, and this is more at the end of the process, is kind of a liquidating trust. And that is something that is after the company emerges from bankruptcy, the reorganizable pieces are um, set into new co. And then these are, you know, leftover assets, typically small, typically non-core to the reorganized business um, and also unresolved liabilities. And it's, it's another mechanism to, um, to find a way to sell off assets in a clean way. It, sometimes it can be real estate assets. It's typically small, non-core, um, and it's basically pieces that the go-forward acquirer or the reorganized business, it wasn't part of their go-forward strategy. And in that case, there's typically a liquidating trustee who comes in after, after the confirmation of the main bankruptcy, and they're charged with selling the remaining assets, resolving outstanding liabilities, um, et cetera. Thank you. Liz, can you give us a little overseeing of the process? Yes, so we have we can uh, deal with it in one of two ways. We have borrowed from our friends in the U.S. and and the concept of the three sixty three. So if you want to, if it and oftentimes we do see that where it's a more formal basis, you have a sales process and bidding procedures uh, approved up front. You have a stocking horse, so someone who's going to be the floor price um, for this uh, for the deal, and anyone else who wants to come in and participate needs to at least be as good as that stocking horse, and then you proceed ultimately to an auction with the hopes that that drives up the price that's available for everyone. So that's the formal stocking horse 363 process that we have. We have all also we can run it more as just straight bids. So if you don't have time for a stocking horse, or if you don't think that there's anyone who would be participating in that fashion, and if the types of assets that you have for up for sale were more conducive to just getting a top bid, 
the person running the sales process can just go out to the market without a floor price and say 60 days from now, I open up a data room, everyone come in and 60 days from now, it's the best bid. So there is no auction that's contemplated at the tail end. So that's two ways, two structures. Um, we, we can do that once the proceeding starts and have the sales process formally approved and conducted. There are times where it's also run or at least started before the CCAA starts. Um, you have whoever your monitor and waiting is, is helping you with that process because they will be ultimately asked to report on it. So you can start your process ahead of time, canvas the market somewhat, perhaps identify a stocking horse during that pre-filing time period, and then start the process. So you have one or two, one of two ways. In our world, when the process is king. So if you run the process, the monitor approves of the process, and you're going to the court, we don't, the courts are not receptive to, to I think, what's the expression, auction at the courthouse steps. If we're going to the court with a bid that has been identified as the top bid, the top transaction, that's the one we're going to go to the court and seek approval for. The courts are not generally receptive of someone standing up and said, I will bid an extra dollar uh, on the top uh, to top that. Um, the process is king and we have a concept of bitter bitter <laughs> where someone had an opportunity to participate in the process, didn't, oftentimes they won't even have standing um, to try to criticize or seek to top the bid. So process is very much driving the ultimate um, end transaction. Thanks. And I'm not sure if other jurisdictions um, permit that kind of continuing auction when you get to the courthouse a little bit more than perhaps our Canadian courts would. I'm not really sure to in other jurisdictions, but it's uh, the first time I hear something like that with that kind of dynamics. Alejandro, can you comment on the, on the Mexican process, please? Uh, uh, yes, you know I will split. The, I will split because it's very different if this is a, a carry out within the restructuring or conciliation phase as opposed to the liquidation or or quiebra stage. Uh, in the conciliation, is very straightforward. You know, basically, normally the, the company and their restructuring advisors approach the conciliador, uh, present all the all the appraisals and all the justifications and, and rationale on on the need to sell those uh, non-key assets because you cannot proceed to, to sell the key assets of the company unless that is part of the plan. Uh, so, so you need, for example, if you have a manufacturing company and they have an extra real estate, that's the type of assets that you will focus to get liquidity. Uh, then the conciliador will present a writ uh, uh, before the court, uh, basically sustaining and supporting the, their support uh, uh, in favor of that sale. And then the judge uh, could approve it or, or could object it or, or basically said, based on the opinion of the conciliador, I'm authorizing or not objecting that. Uh, certainly that is subject uh, uh, to be a challenge by third parties if, if anyone uh, with a legal interest with legal standing argues that the value is too low, that it's a fraudulent conveyance, that this is really to be implemented among related parties just to, to, to take out from the state value, okay? As opposed to a liquidation stage, the quiebra stage, that then it is not a debtor in possession, the receiver or the liquidator is appointed, they need to follow very strict rules and process and, and timing uh, providing our concursos law uh, in order to proceed with those sales. Again, they, they can do it if, the, if they if they are in urgency to, to sell an asset in, that could otherwise lose value, they could do it and just present the justification afterwards, but otherwise they can do that uh, directly in units, in portions. Uh, normally, the, you need to follow a very strict a, a public auction a, a, with very specific rules on how to participate, how to present a bids, a, a, the, the terms to, to do that. A, and, and also after six months a, that the company has been the debtor in the liquidation stage, any third party also could present a separate a, a bids as a stocking horse to buy some of the assets, all of the assets, portion of the assets, and then and then they are free to present whatever uh, value they consider. No, uh, so that is you know basically the, the situation. But again, there are very specific and and strict rules that you need to follow 
uh, particularly during the quiebra or liquidation state, a stage that uh, there's a huge responsibility on, on the part of the liquidator or receiver. Great, thank you. Uh, do not make this a competition. I'm not asking which is better or not, but for, for the floor, um, which similar similarities do you find in these uh, processes and the highlights? What do you have to take care about if you are going to go into uh, sales assets in, this, uh, in your jurisdictions? Lisa, when, do you want to start? So you you want to you what want to understand you, about selling foreign assets in a U.S. Chapter Eleven? Is that your question? I'm as a Mexican want to make it go into a sale process in the jurisdiction. What I have to take care about? Oh, I see. Okay, um, sorry, I misunderstood the question. You know, more and more we're seeing the use of Chapter Eleven um, for foreign companies as a mechanism to either reorganize or, in lots of cases, to sell assets. So, you know, the the process is very similar. In fact, it's the same process with a few added nuances. Number one, always make sure that you have um, local counsel so that you're sitting in a U.S. Chapter 11 and you're governed by the, the laws and the rules of a U.S. Chapter 11. But when it comes to asset sales in other countries, you need to make sure that equally you're running those processes and you've got, um, you know, you've got Alejandro signs with you like we had in Air Mexico. You want someone by your side who is driving the um, local side of it, understands what has to happen, particularly if it's a public company, what has to happen to make sure the notices you're not um, getting sideways with any of the local laws. Um, and depending on where you are, of course, the local laws can be dramatically different. I think that all sale processes, whether they're cross-border or not, um, and it's the same if you're working in you know, a parallel chapter 11 and a CCAA, making sure you've got a Liz on your side to make sure that your protocols are in place and that you're doing what you need to do from a Canadian perspective and a US law perspective. Um, creative plans are super important that you've got the right um, analysis, you've got your valuation set, and ideally you've got all your stakeholders agreeing on your process. But I think the main difference when you're selling, you know, cross-border things is make sure you've got good solid local counsel and local representation. Great, thanks. Please. Um, I would agree with all of that. Um, I think you also, it's really a coordination issue. Um, you need to understand where can, do you need to be running a process in both the jurisdictions? Can one jurisdiction be the primary one? Um, is it more appropriate for one to be the primary one? It may not necessarily be where the parent sits sometimes. Um, if, you're, if you find there is a process, are there certain, what are the types of assets that you're trying to sell and are they easier to sell in one jurisdiction or another? There's a little bit of creative planning that needs to happen before you determine, because otherwise either both sides will just go to their natural corners and say, well, we should start my proceeding here. But there's a bit of coordination, learning what the other jurisdiction has to offer. And are there any pitfalls that you don't want to walk into? Or do you need to do you need to structure your um, the entire process around them? Um, what are you really selling in the other jurisdiction? Are you able to sell the subsidiary intact without actually thinking about vesting orders or asset deals? Because then maybe it is easier to just deal with it at the top co. Those types of things. I can think of a lot of holding companies that sit in one jurisdiction and the operating entities in the other, and you can perhaps do quicker sales at the holding company level. So it's a, it really is a coordination, learning a little bit more about the other jurisdiction and making sure overall that you can get something done as quickly as possible, because given the cost that can continue to escalate if you are dealing with two different proceedings and learning pitfalls along the way. Right, Alejandro? Uh, yes, I, I would say that there's no like a quick answer uh, for that because it depends on the on the specific uh, situation of that debtor, the, the type of uh, activities that they have, where are their main uh, creditors' activities, and particularly where those assets that are going to be subject to the sale are located. No, so so I would say, in my view, that from the Mexican perspective, 
you will not make a decision on where to restructure uh, based on a, on a potential or future sale of assets, unless, of course, as part of the plan you're envisioning uh, uh, that the organization plan or the liquidation plan will be to sell all of the assets. No, So if, even if you're a Mexican company and, and if you really have a huge operations in US or in Canada, uh, certainly you will you will follow uh, the, the local advice there. And maybe you can even uh, proceed as a Mexican a debtor to a full chapter 11 in US, for example, or, or similar process in, 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 in Canada. Or otherwise, if you already have a main proceeding in, in Mexico as a concurso process, you can use, for example, a chapter 15 to get a better recognition of that sale of assets or, or the unit or whatever, or whether it's out of an insider plan in a chapter 15, or again, the, the similar situation in, in Canada, similar chapter on, on recognition of a of a main a foreign insolvency proceeding. No? So, so I think that that would depend on, on, on the specific a, a, a case. And not all the Mexican companies a, have the 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 funds uh, and, and the size uh, to, to be restructured, for example, in a chapter 11. Uh, and again, depending on the size, because at the end, if the assets are located in Mexico, and for example, our real estate assets, you will need, as you know, Ivan, to follow the specific and strict uh, rules in order to implement a sale and to document it in Mexico, subject to Mexican law, uh, not republics, registrations in Mexico. So at the end, even if you have a company being restructured in, in a chapter 11, if you want to, to proceed with a sale of an asset as part of that chapter 11 on an asset located in Mexico, you need to observe, depending on the type of assets, all the regulations and requirements in Mexico. Great, thank you. We are running out of time. Do you want to give any quick re uh, remark, closing remark, any one of you? No? Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry that we do not have a, a, too much time. So it's, it was been very pleasure to hear you. Uh, in, on behalf of the IIII, uh, thank you for your participation, and we will see each other in the field. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.